Leave it to, to, to the gentleman in the, in the room. <laughs> so he's 75. Do you know that thing? Shut up! So I had to tie like this great knot structure on his so hey, I'm Dr. Rachel Ross, family medicine physician and clinical sexologist. So everything from the flu to the ooh. Growing up, you're kind of like, well, wait a minute, why do I like that? Why do I like this person? Or why don't I like this person? And so from that just grew this curiosity about sex and there were no answers. You know, like there were just, I just realized that there was this whole in things that needed to be that needed, to, that needed to be filled in. And so I was like, well, that might as well be me. I think when I first started and became a sexologist, it was kind of a, like a what, but you do what? Are you having sex with your clients? Like, what is this? But I think now most doctors don't know anything about sex either. And so they're happy that there's this whole field dedicated to sex and sexuality because it means that they don't have to help anybody with it. And I'm really excited about that. The conversation and the dialogue is changing. People aren't frowning on it. When I first became a sexologist, I was a little in the closet about it. I had all these patients, right? I was seeing them for diabetes, hypertension, the flu. And they'll tell you like, Three or four years in, they had no idea I was a sexologist till they saw it on television. They're like, wait, girl, you do what? And so, you know, I'm like, well, I mean, you know, I had all these older patients. I just didn't think that they would embrace it the way that they did. And so I think oftentimes we put such a stigma on sex that even when you choose a career that's based around sex, and even if it's reputable and you've got, the, you know, this degree and this degree, you still kind of feel a little ashamed about it. For me personally, I've always said that as a sexologist, one of my biggest goals is to kind of help keep families together because honestly, if you are in touch with your sexuality and, and you're in a coupled relationship and sex isn't a problem, you know, if we can get that part right, then the financial part and all the other stuff comes a little easier. I think back to like my messages were like, study, do your work, keep your legs closed, right? So you do that, you study, you do your legs and you keep your legs closed, you, you know, you may stray off of that a little bit, but I think too it sends the message that finding someone isn't that important. And I think that our culture is the only culture that doesn't just tell you, yeah, I mean, it really is about trying to find somebody and figure out what that is. All of those things swirled together is what makes me want to be a sexologist, which made me become a sexologist and then made me go into the path that I've done. And so. Now, my career has kind of transitioned where I train other sexologists to go in and help people with coming out issues. Maybe it's a sex drive issue. Maybe it's a, we love each other, we're soulmates, but, but sex is terrible. You know, so, so depending on where it is, that's where the sexologist meets you and helps you along the way. Having a sister that passed away from sickle cell, I mean, it, it, it just changes everything because I think I've always been on the side of medicine as, 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 as giving you know, as taking care of people. So then when a member of your family becomes sick and you realize that as an, a black person, as a black family, you have to deal with the same bullshit that everybody else does, it really changes your relationship with medicine and the healthcare community. So um, besides now just really spending a lot of time advocating for policies and procedures that are a little more, less biased, I think it also, um, you know, it's just a humbling experience when your best friend in the universe passes away. It's just kind of like, oh, shit, what do I do now? Um, so, so yeah, you know, and, and in terms of how it changes how we practice medicine, so, you know, we all work together, so. You know, it's, it's funny, you know, everybody's like, time, you know, it just takes time. I mean, she passed in 2011, but, um, it's just one of those things that you, that, you know, changes your life completely. We went to med school together, you know, we did everything together. So. And then, you know, it's something that only brown people get. And then we got to the hospital and they didn't, you know, it's interesting because I always tell people, when you're black, if you get sick, go to the black hospital. I know we think that white is better and their ice is colder than ours, but the problem is if they don't have any respect for you and they don't believe in you, then they don't listen to you. And I think that that's popping up more and more. It's just, it's just a reality check. And she was pregnant and we're more likely to die trying to give birth than anybody else. So, so 
what it's really done for me is given me the opportunity that the next project is really about that. It's about racism and how it affects healthcare and how it affects us and our lives and how it's just really got to change. And so it's changed how I practice medicine. It changes how I see healthcare delivery and it changes what I'm willing to do. You know, you'll never see me on anybody's drug commercial. You'll never see me endorsing a, um, insurance company. It just changes because I see what they do to us on a daily basis and um, it, it's got to change. That opened up a whole can. <laughs> of course I've shared with you the whole racism and healthcare piece but the sex piece is going pretty strong too. What are some common misconceptions about sex? I think the biggest thing is, particularly for ladies, is we expect that this sex drive is just, uh, you know, where is it? Like, I'm driving, I should be thinking about sex, or, you know, like, why don't I think about sex the way my guy does? One of the misconceptions is that for women, the sex drive starts with this desire, like, desiring to do it. But no, for a lot of us, it just starts at a number of different spaces, and I think if we understood more about where sex originates in our brain, then you don't beat yourself up when you don't feel like having it every day or you don't place unrealistic expectations on yourself. Because when you first get with somebody, you want to have sex all the time, right? Because it's new, you want him or her to be like, ooh, oh, she, she got it going on. But the reality is that was never really your sex drive to begin with. The motivation behind it was to impress, to kind of feel it out, see what was out there. And so if we can start to understand a little bit more about where the sex drive comes from, then you have less problems when Three months later, the girl's like, well, you know, I want to slow down a little bit. I don't think I want to have sex anymore or whatever it is. And he's like, well, wait a minute, who's this new person? So I think that's a big one. I think for women about sex, the main thing is women are trying to figure out how can I have an orgasm during penetration, right? Like I can have one with my vibrator. I can have one when my partner goes down on me. But once all that starts, like where does the orgasm go? That's the number one question I get from ladies. Um, and the one I get from guys is, you know, they want to last longer. They want to be bigger. They want to be stronger. Um, and then for ladies, I always say, you know, the best thing that you can do to try to increase your chances of having an orgasm when you're penetrating, your partner's penetrating, is one, let them know that if they get you pretty much to the point where you're begging for it before they penetrate, then it's much easier to have an orgasm, right? That way, that person doesn't have to last as long and it's easier. And then the next piece is the alignment is usually off, right? Um, because a lot of people train their sexual style off of porn. So all of that body back, you know, away, you know, like, you, you know, showboating ends up taking away from the experience. So if they shift the pelvises a little bit, we call it the coital alignment technique, so that actually when the partner goes and is penetrating, that there's actually some rubbing and friction around the pubic area, then she's way more likely to have an orgasm than, than the old way. So as a sexologist, the coolest part is you get to be in spaces that would probably be considered odd for you to be in if you weren't a professional sexologist, right? So I've always prided myself on that. So, you know, like in college, I would go to swingers parties and just, you know, be like, well, you know, this is research, 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 right? So recently, um, a student of the Dr. Rachel Institute was this like high-end um, dominatrix. And she, she has dominatrix classes. So I said, oh, this is fantastic. Let me do this. She, she said, well, you know, Dr. Rachel, I'm going to comp your, your uh, tuition, you know, come on down. So I was like, oh, great. I'm going to get an outfit. So I went and bought like a, a leather corset. You know, I was ready. So she was giving me all the details about it. And I was like, oh, okay. You know how one of those things you like half read, but you know, you're just kind of like, oh, okay, okay. So I'll be there. So it was three days and I was just kind of like, why do I need to be training for dominatrix for three days? But I was like, okay. So I get there, she hands out the rope. She gives out some folders with some notes in it. I'm like, oh great, this is right up my alley. I sit back, I start taking notes. She's like, well, la la ladies, let me introduce you to your subs. So out from the back comes like six white guys in like these tight satin panties, right? And they were all over the age of 55, right? <laughs> And they come out in these collars and t-shirts and panties, you know? That's what I was like, wait a minute, wait a minute. So then she starts 
um, showing us rope techniques, right? I'm like, okay, I'm back to my taking notes very studiously. And then she's like, okay, partner up. <laughs> I was like, partner up. So I, had to, I stepped out and I started sending these text messages. You know how you send a message like, I don't think I should be here. <laughs> so, and then, then, then there's this part of me that's like, you're a sexologist, you've got to get back in there, you can't embarrass yourself. She's introduced you as Dr. Rachel, you know, to all these other six ladies. It's like, okay. <laughs> so I went back in there and I picked the 75 year old gentleman from Louisiana. <laughs> and I get my rope out and I didn't realize that so much of it was about tying knots, right? So I had to tie like this great knot structure on his testicles, right? So good thing, good thing, I, <laughs> good thing I'm also a physician and you know, it see penises all the time and this is no big deal. You know, he's talking about the weather and all of this. And I mean, that experience in and of itself, I would say is probably my most interesting sexology thing because First of all, you know, like we talk about cock rings and how, you know, they, they just, you, they, can, they can help just bring the power back. I tell you, when I put the little, because we had to do like what's called the fishbowl where you like act out, you know, so that you can, they give you a scenario and they tell you to act it out. And so I was, you know, hiding in the corner and they're like, Dr. Rachel, we want to see you do one. So I was like, okay. So I start lacing up my boots very slowly and I put, so I've got my 75 year old partner. So I'd practice my knots. So I get up there. And I, you know, I tell him to lick my boots, you know, so he licks my boots. I'm like, okay, what am I gonna say next? Okay, so I get my rope out, tie the thing. And so after I tie it, I had a little crop, right? So I, you know, swat, swat him a little bit. And do you know, so he's 75. Do you know that thing shot up like this? I was like, what? I'm walking around, I'm like, you know, because being a dominatrix isn't as much about torturing people as it is about teasing them and having them please you. But let me tell you something, she charges $350 an hour. And so she actually has clients that, you know, sometimes might be there four or five or six hours because after you do all of that, then you have to do aftercare where you, you know, take care of them and make them feel comfortable. Training to be a dominatrix, that's probably the most interesting thing that, that's ever ever happen. So now if you ever decide you want to be a dominatrix, really do your homework first because there's way more levels to it than you ever could possibly imagine. You can find me at Dr. Rachel. So just spell Rachel right. D-R-R-A-C-H-A-E-L. That's my YouTube channel. That's my Instagram and uh, that's Facebook too.